Israel's war on Palestinians is not confined to Gaza. With Ramadan underway, we're watching the occupied West Bank and the Israeli settlers driving the story. Bollywood, Indian filmmakers are playing an unofficial part in Narendra Modi's re-election campaign. And George Soros, the scourge of populist leaders almost everywhere. How? Why? Last Monday, the Muslim holy month of Ramadan began. For Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank, it was marked by an influx of Israeli troops, many coming by way of the killing fields of Gaza. Prior to October 7th, life in the West Bank was already difficult enough. In 2023, 509 Palestinians were killed there, including 120 children, either by Israeli troops or Israeli settlers. Since October 7th, things have grown worse. For Palestinian journalists, reporting on these stories has become nearly impossible. With their movements severely restricted, dozens have been arrested and held under what the Israelis call administrative detention, but what really amounts to indefinite imprisonment without trial or charge. With the global media's attention trained on Gaza, ours included, what Palestinians are going through in the West Bank often goes unreported. Theirs is not a story of genocide, but of being oppressed, dehumanized, and living with the constant fear of getting killed by those suspected of genocide. It is all part of Palestinian life under Israeli occupation. It was the morning after the sighting of the crescent moon, the start of Ramadan. With the West Bank and East Jerusalem effectively under lockdown, Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, delivered a message to Palestinians in Arabic, or at least tried to. <laughs> then Gallant switched to Hebrew, the language of his intended audience, having, as journalists would say, buried the lead. In a very bad Arabic accent, trying to wish well to Palestinians, which is both paternalistic and manipulative, because it was followed up by basically a threat. What he was essentially telling Palestinians is that we are not done with you yet. Don't even try to think about worshipping as Muslim Palestinians or that this holy month is going to be any different than the last five months that you have witnessed. I thought to myself, what sort of conversations were taking place in the room as this video was recorded? What is the aim? You know, when they stopped recording, did somebody turn to him and say, yes, this will achieve the goal of making the West Bank more quiet? I very much doubt this. Remember that this is the same man who, in October, uh, talked about ordering the uh, electricity, water, and food being cut from Gaza and referring to Palestinians as human animals. The consequences of that policy, children actually dying of starvation in Gaza, that's really why the effect is so chilling. Exhibit A of that effect came on the following day. Rami Hamda, a 13-year-old boy in Jerusalem who set off some fireworks to celebrate Ramadan, was shot dead by an Israeli policeman who said he felt threatened. Israel's security minister, the extremist Itamar ben Gavir, then came as close as one can come to praising the killing of a child who he mistakenly thought was just 12. Since Hamas's attacks on October 7th, global news outlets have been transfixed by Israel's war on Gaza, diverted from the West Bank, where Israeli settlers, backed by soldiers, keep stealing Palestinian land and violating international law. Three days prior to Ramadan, Israel boosted the number of its troops in the West Bank. Many of the soldiers moving in have just come out of the Strip, where they have been committing war crimes, celebrating them, and callously posting the evidence online. The arrival of such vengeful Israeli forces 
bodes badly for Palestinians in the West Bank, who have already had it historically hard. This is a process we've been seeing before October 7, a process that increased under the extreme right-wing government of raids into Palestinian towns and the attempt of right-wing settlers to push Palestinian communities. And this is done with the backup of the Israeli military. Since October 7, both the army and the settler have been building new outposts, pushing away Palestinian communities and increasing military raids and killings. Moving troops to the West Bank increases, in certain instances, uh, tensions rather than reduce it. More troops means more targets. So for this to be happening is scary for us. It's scary not because the level of troops moved is unprecedented. It's because these troops are coming from a genocide field, a shooting range. Israel's war on journalism in Gaza, where more than 130 reporters have been killed, has also distracted from what other Palestinian journalists are up against. More than 50 have been arrested in the West Bank, many of them jailed, usually without charge, locked up indefinitely under what Israel euphemistically calls administrative detention. Often, that means that attacks by settlers in the West Bank, where more than 500 Palestinians have been killed in the last year alone, go unreported. Following the news that does come out has its dangers. One month after October 7th, Israel passed a new law criminalizing the sharing or consuming of online content that the Israeli authorities deem related to terrorism, leading to arrests like this one of a Palestinian couple after the woman had changed her WhatsApp status. <laughs> The new law could affect any Palestinian, including journalists in the West Bank, who face so many challenges, just getting to stories that need to be covered. For Palestinian journalists in the West Bank, uh, the biggest problem is the movement restrictions that we've seen since October 7. Checkpoints, roadblocks, flying checkpoints, it's just literally hard for Palestinians to move in the West Bank. So also from my Palestinian colleagues, I, I hear that it's very hard and dangerous to move because of the army because of settlers, because of the checkpoint, it's just very hard to access these places, especially communities that have been targeted by settler violence. It's just dangerous to Palestinians. Palestinian journalists have always been uh, a target for the Israeli uh, authorities. Covering these violations, providing a voice for these communities, and being even a source of hope for these communities has made Palestinian journalists a target. This is part of Israel's strategy to control the flow of information and to dictate the narratives. Well, it's very dangerous being a Palestinian journalist. Unfortunately, the press vest does not seem to protect them from harm or from being killed. And this is, again, before October 7th. Uh, you don't, don't have to look further than the case of Shirin Abu Akla, uh, Al Jazeera journalist, Palestinian-American journalist. And I emphasize American because not only did Israel not hold anybody accountable for the crime, of shooting her and killing her, Israeli soldiers, neither did the United States, a country which is a citizen of. Israel brands itself, prides itself on being the Middle East's only democracy. You wouldn't know it from the way their media outlets have been behaving. <laughs> Beyond the bloodlust being broadcast over Gaza, those outlets often turn a blind eye to what's happening in the West Bank, the never-ending, settler-driven violations of international law. When they do focus on that story, they have been known to sound complicit in laying the groundwork for ethnic cleansing. Over the years, Israel has managed its occupation of Palestinians by using a divide-and-conquer strategy, sealing Gaza and the West Bank off from one another politically and keeping Palestinians apart. With the death toll in Gaza now exceeding 31,000 and people starving there, that is the story that news audiences have been focusing on. But with the West Bank at such a boiling point, the eyes of the world need to be on that side of the story as well. Those lives matter too whether the Israeli media see it that way or not. The Israeli media reports only when there's violence towards Israelis. 
when there's Palestinian resistance, as they call it, terror attacks or attacks that harm Israelis, this has been fully reported and covered. While on settler violence, this has been reported only on very massive uh, events like the attack in Hawara last year. But on the day-to-day -day reality, the attacks, the uh, killings are not being covered at all. The Israeli media, in fact, um, has uh, played a very important role to lay the groundwork for the dehumanization of Palestinians, the covering up for state terrorism and armed uh, settlers emboldened by protection from the Israeli army who commit crimes. All of this would not happen if the Israeli media was, was doing its, its job. I don't think Gaza is giving cover for Israel to carry out crimes in the West Bank. They killed 31,000 Palestinians in Gaza. They really don't need a cover. Clearly, they can do what they want and get away with it. But what it has done is definitely curtail our capacity to bring forward and expose what is happening in the West Bank. There's an election coming in India that has Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party favored to win an historic third term. Having brought broadcast journalism to heel long ago, the BJP is now focused on other forms of media messaging, including film. Tarek Nafa is here with more. The big screen is not a new messaging platform for the Modi government, but the slew of films released recently or expected to hit theatres during the election season is significant. There are at least 10 movies that are built explicitly around some of the Modi government's key policies and talking points. Among the films recently released, a biopic of the Hindu nationalist ideologue Veer Sarvakar, a militant activist for Hindu supremacy, Sarvakar's image has been steadily rehabilitated by India's right wing. Another movie just out is called Article 370. That's the constitutional clause that granted Kashmir limited autonomy before it was revoked by the BJP government in 2019. The film purports to show the behind-the-scenes story of the making of that decision. When it's special status, we can't put it in our hands. These productions vary in size and prominence. Some are from lesser-known studios, others from major production houses. The star power varies as well. While none of the films feature any of India's top actors, there are a range of celebrities, from B-list talent to brand new faces taking part in these films. It's like the weather is method acting. In India, Modi and the BJP have a huge advantage in the media sphere. They have co-opted or cowed virtually all mainstream news outlets. And the Prime Minister goes viral on social platforms almost every day. They probably don't need Bollywood in their corner as well, but they're leaving no media stone unturned. Thanks, Tarek. At age 93, George Soros, the Hungarian-American billionaire, financier and philanthropist, is a polarizing figure. Depending on who you ask, he is either a selfless man dedicated to worthwhile social causes or the devil in disguise. Many right-wing politicians describe him as the latter, thanks to a smear campaign concocted a few years ago by political operatives working for Hungary's Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. The branding of Soros as some kind of puppet master, manipulating politics in multiple countries from somewhere in the shadows, is now a go-to trope for populist leaders around the world, including in Soros' adopted home country, the U.S., where it is a frequent talking point of conservative politicians and pundits alike. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on the scapegoating of George Soros and if there's anything really there. Try typing the name George Soros into Google, and these are the kind of headlines you might get. The most dangerous man in America. The billionaire who broke the Bank of England. Soros backed. Soros linked. Soros funded. Soros, Soros, Soros. 
George Soros is a, a divisive figure that uh, is going to uh, always attract the attention for many reasons. And um, um, I think that is uh, both because of his business activities, but also because of his involvement in supporting a number of causes in many countries. So definitely, I think he is um, loathed by, by many. The fact that, he's, that he worked in finance, the fact that he's Jewish, you know, that he's all controlling or he's an outsider or he's a speculator or he's trying to undermine the nation. He's a destruction to our civilization and a clear and present danger to our country. He has all of these traits that make him a really attractive candidate as the target of conspiracy theories. So many theories, so little truth. So here are the facts. George Soros was born in 1930s Hungary to a Jewish family, avoiding deportation to a Nazi concentration camp by securing false ID and concealing his background. He later moved to London, where he studied economics, then New York, where he made millions, then billions, speculating on international markets, before turning his hand to philanthropy. In 1993, he launched his Open Society Foundations, which vows to build vibrant and inclusive democracies. It's now one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the world. So how has someone who's given so much time and money become the target of countless conspiracy theories? The answer lies in the land of his birth, Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban needed an enemy. So in 2015, George Soros published this think piece where he calls for a plan on how to handle the refugee crisis. Viktor Orban takes this little essay and turns it into something very different, kind of like a, a giant master plan, the Soros plan, a plan to replace the European population with the immigrants and they use this for political campaigning and then there's, there's even like political posters they created where they show George Soros and a bunch of allies in a photo montage cutting through a wire fence. There was a, uh, a campaign that was based on, based on a series of, of billboards that um, actually uh, shown uh, George Soros with uh, devilish eyes and with a slogan that, that said, let's not have uh, Soros have the last laugh. All the messages that you saw on billboards that were coming from the Prime Minister and his staff were republished and promoted in, in the Hungarian media, in the pro-government media. The Prime Minister needed an enemy and of course they needed someone from abroad, someone who would occupy Hungary, someone with foreign interests, someone related with international financial conspiracies. So they hired this, um, uh, these two uh, consultants these two spin doctors and um, they have actually helped um, help him create the, the so-called Soros plan. Those masters of spin were two Jewish Americans, Arthur Finkelstein and George Birnbaum. Finkelstein had made a name for himself, securing victory for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in 1996. Netanyahu repaid the favor with an introduction to Viktor Orban. The pair went on to devise one of the most destructive smear campaigns of the 21st century, branding George Soros the billionaire bogeyman. Arthur Finkelstein developed a specific uh, political uh, philosophy, uh, an idea that we call Finkelthink. His politics was about the vilification of the political enemy. Finkelstein's idea was, what if we lift the curtain and behind the curtain of these international elites, all of a sudden, there's this one figure. You don't fight against the Nazis, you fight against Adolf Hitler. You don't fight against Al-Qaeda, you fight against Osama bin Laden, right? And so, George Soros could become the face of the enemy. Nekünk nem a vérszegény ellenzéki pártocskákkal kell megküzdenünk, hanem egy birodalommal szervezett nemzetközi hálózattal amit Soros György neve foglal össze, és ő testesít meg. George Soros wasn't just an enemy for Viktor Orban, 
What Finkelstein and Birnbaum formulated was a blueprint ripe for adoption by right-wing populist leaders around the world. Regardless of a country's specific socio-political context, Soros met the brief, a symbol of opaque global capitalism with a philanthropic front that tapped into deeply rooted anti-Semitic tropes. He is still, for many uh, governments in the world, the scapegoat simply because, uh, so to speak, he ticks all the boxes. In Turkey, Erdogan, he uh, at some point in time referred to Soros as being the man who is going to destroy his country. We have in Italy Matteo Salvini, who many times spoke about the support that George Soros gave to organizations supporting migrants. No, Soros is one of those who would like Italy a camp of refugees, and Europe an enormous camp of refugees, because to him they like the slaves. Even Nigel Farage from the UK party in Great Britain mentioned Soros in, in his speeches and he made this direct link between George Soros and the flood of migrants in the Western European world. If you really examine the money this man is spending across the whole of Europe, in America, to push his agenda, which is to get rid of the nation state and to encourage mass migration. So we have it everywhere. Fox News has played a huge role in pushing the idea that Soros was trying to replace the American population with people from abroad and that Soros was hijacking democracy. But his program for the past 15 years at least has been to make the societies he focuses on more dangerous, dirtier, less democratic. In other words, it's a program of destruction aimed at the West. And it, what's interesting, you, you might have thought that it would stop when Trump left office. Actually, the opposite is the case. I think that here in the United States, these conspiracy theories are more potent um, and omnipresent than they were before. So is there an end in sight? There is for Soros himself. Now 93, he's slowly stepping out of the spotlight, handing the reins of his philanthropic foundation to his son, Alex. But as for what he's come to represent, the billionaire bogeyman, the shadowy scapegoat, the puppet master personifying all evils, now that has taken on a life of its own. I think it's really hard to say what Zoros' legacy will be. I went to the last CEU graduation, and I was sitting there thinking, gosh, well, after Soros, who were people going to, like, who were they going to attack? And then Alex Soros walked onto the stage, and I had this moment of like, oh, him, right, of course. Um, so I, I certainly think that people will try to run the same script. If you think of the uh, Finkelstein and Birnbaum versus Soros <laughs> um, fight, Future historians will look back at this fight as like the epitome of like a, a giant, almost global political discussion where liberal politics goes against this new breed of post-liberal or illiberal politics. So it's like a global campaign because it's globalized political uh, warfare now. And finally, one story that got a lot of play this past week was that doctored photo issued by the British royal family purporting that all was well with a certain princess, duchess, whatever they call her. It was instructive to see how quickly that image was picked apart by experts and the way that people on social media spread what was basically a story about media manipulation. Which makes this a good time to remember to put those critical thinking skills to use when you get news that is far more serious than royal gossip, such as Israel's war on Gaza, especially when dealing with a source like the Israeli government, with its track record of manipulating the truth. Is there an apples and oranges element to the comparison? Undoubtedly. But it's still worth making, worth thinking about. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.